Herzlich willkommen beim Deutschen Französischen Energie. Welcome to the Franco-German Energy Forum. Europe post-COVID-19, political and economic agendas for the energy transition and climate change mitigation. So this is a forum in the midst of the crisis. We are in the middle of the second wave and we look ahead because we are optimistic about this. My name is Barbara Kostolnik. I'm correspondent of the ARD Capital Studio in Berlin. Before that, I worked in Paris. I would like to thank all participants. 650 people um, participate. So what we are talking about today is of great interest. I would also like to thank the co-organizers, the Foreign Office, the host, the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy, the French Embassy, and the Franco-German Office for the Gender Transition. Thank you for organizing this event, a big conference, which has involved a lot of work. As it is um, our habit during times of COVID-19. We are online. There are different streaming channels in English, French, and German, and you can switch between these channels. You can also ask questions via our chat. So please um, do that during our panels. I would like to um, make one request to the speakers, please speak slowly and please um, speak into your microphones and please don't use too many abbreviations. Um, the interpreters will be grateful for that. The presentations that will be shown here today will be published one week after this conference on the website of the um, Franco-German Office for the Energy Transition. And, of course, it is accessible to all participants. So these were the technical details. Um, I would now like to hand over to State Secretary Annen from the Federal Foreign Office. Thank you for being here today. Good morning. You have just come back from quarantine. We were supposed to see each other two weeks ago, but that didn't work. But it's great you can be here today. I would now like to pass the floor to you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm delighted to welcome you from the almost empty hall in the Foreign Office. I would like to um, welcome you, Ambassador de Scott, first and foremost, State Secretary Feicht, Mr. Rössner, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you most warmly to this year's Franco-German Energy Forum. The title this year is Europe Post-COVID-19, Political and Economic Agendas for the Energy Transition and Climate Change Mitigation. It is a raison d'etre of the Franco-German Office for the Energy Transition, or the Franco-German Energy Forum, to bring together decision makers from Germany and France from the areas of energy and climate in order to firstly implement the energy transition more swiftly, driven and accelerated by Franco-German cooperation, and in order to secondly advance bilateral cooperation between Germany and France, also in the decisive area of the energy transition that will be so important for the next decades, both in terms of economic and environmental policies. In the face of the current situation in France and in Germany, I am addressing you online today. You've already mentioned this. And of course, after so many months of the corona pandemic, it is regrettable that we cannot meet in person today. However, I think that we have gotten kind of used to it. And that is why I am optimistic that we can reach our goals in the context of this format too. We want to communicate ideas. We want to stress the significance of the topics and of bilateral cooperation. And we want to give stakeholders the opportunity to engage in networking. 
Surely the pandemic has not only had negative effects when it comes to energy and climate matters, and I don't want to sound cynical here. I'm thinking particularly of Europe, because apart from the fact that we have seen temporary greenhouse gas emission reductions due to lockdowns, this pandemic has unprecedented public funds, and this particularly applies to Berlin, Paris, and Brussels. These funds are to be particularly used for the so-called green recovery in the context of the overall recovery. And the title of this year's Energy Forum alludes to this, especially the presentations during the late afternoon will look into this topic in more detail. I therefore hope that we all can also see um, COVID-19 as an opportunity to, as a paradigm shift that can entail a digital green renewal of our national economies. Geopolitically, especially in the context of the groundbreaking European Green Deal, it can turn Europe into an economic trailblazer at a global level. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, it is up to us, to policymakers, to create respective regulatory basic conditions. Only like this can you, the energy industry, breathe life and economic and ecological success into them. I hope that this forum can play a small, modest part in this in order to reach these goals. With the next multi-annual financial framework 2021 to 2027 and the Corona Recovery Fund Next Generation EU, we, the EU, are about to set up a financial package of an unprecedented sum of around 1. trillion euros. Out of these funds, at least 30% are to be provided for green investments. The negotiations between the Council, the Commission and the European Parliament are ongoing, and as you can see from the media, this is not always easy. However, I very much hope that we can conclude this package under the German EU presidency. These funds have to be used in Europe at a collective level in order to make the next big step towards the energy transition. Like this, we will globally consolidate our role as a pioneer when it comes to climate protection and modern basic conditions at the level of energy industry policy. Because, let's be honest, China has made great strides concerning this topic. We must not fall behind here. On a day like today, everybody is looking to the U.S. and the U.S. elections. So let me say, a potential new U.S. administration under Joe Biden might swiftly lead to a U-turn concerning these topics. This is at least what many people hope. The U.S. would then also be leading among energy transition pioneers. And this leads me on to the urgency of the energy transition. It is not only irreversible at an ecological level. To shape the energy transition in a swift way and to make it a market economy access will be key for national economies that want to be successful in the 21st century. The EU needs Franco-German momentum here, among other things. The Franco-German Office for the Energy Transition, or the Franco-German Energy Forum, were created for that very reason. Moreover, cooperation in energy and climate matters is an important priority of the Treaty of Aachen, which was solemnly signed by Federal Chancellor Merkel and the French President Macron in January, 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, that is why we have to lead by example, by excellent bilateral cooperation and by groundbreaking beacon projects in areas as, for example, hydrogen or carbon capture and storage. However, the following always applies. Our cooperation is always an invitation to all other EU member states to become involved in an active way as a partner on APA. The global energy transition is advancing, there can be no doubt. No one, 
not even President Trump can prevent this. Let me illustrate this by reminding you of the key messages of the World Energy Outlook 2020 of the IEA. It was published two weeks ago. Firstly, as a matter of fact, but nonetheless decisive, the age of coal is over. Global demand for coal has um, reached its peak in 2014. New coal-fired power plants are still built, but the overall volume of coal-fired power generation is receding at a global level because at the same time old and environmentally damaging coal-fired power plants are decommissioned. Secondly, the global demand for oil might have reached its peak in 2019. Let me quote Spencer Day from BP. Never in modern history has the demand for fuel decreased in real terms, but this is what we are seeing right now. Thirdly, the IE a doesn't predict a great future for natural gas either. In Europe, gas consumption might already have reached its peak. Gas might serve as a bridge technology towards a decarbonized world in the future. Fourthly, the winners are renewables. According to the IEA, 90% of additional energy demand will be covered by renewable energy sources in the future. So there are good reasons why the EU tries to lead through regulatory measures like the Green Deal and by way of more ambitious climate protection goals. Ladies and gentlemen, now we have to breathe life into these measures. And I would be delighted if Franco-German cooperation played a leading role in this. If joint projects or Franco-German companies led by example in this, and if Europe as a whole could lead the way. Both France and Germany have very ambitious national strategies concerning the establishment of a hydrogen economy, for example. Both national strategies, and by the way, the same applies to the EU strategy on hydrogen, define international cooperation as key. Currently, we, Germany and France, are about to identify beacon projects concerning this in order to then work on their implementation. They are to be turned into EU projects of common interest too. All this makes me feel confident in spite of the huge challenges involved in the energy transition. If the two most important national economies of the EU pull together, if we advance together, this will create the biggest momentum possible for the European energy transition. I am convinced that today's forum can make an important contribution to that. The results of this forum, in one way or another, will be discussed during the Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue 2021-2. This is our big international energy transition conference, which usually, usually takes place in person. It is planned for March 2021. I would like to express my gratitude to all speakers and panelists for their participation and for their contributions. I wish all participants inspiring presentations and debates, and I would like to express my warmest gratitude to the team of the Franco-German Office for the Energy Transition. I would also like to thank the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs, and of course also to my colleagues in the Economic Division of the Foreign Office for the professional preparation and organization of this online event. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Minister, for those uh, positive, optimistic words. This is an opportunity for renewal. Now I'd like to welcome the Ambassador of the F Republic of France in Germany, Anne-Marie Descourt. She's with us by link. You have the floor, ma'am. Thank you very much. Nils Annen. Minister of State Nils Annen. Sehr geehrter Herr Staatssekretär, lieber Andreas Fecht. State Secretary Andreas Fecht. 
Under Secretary of State Giborgi Chetvertinsky, Mr. Rosner, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to say just a few words in German and then I will switch back to French. First of all, I'd like to warmly thank Mr. Rosner for this invitation. Of course, I'm grateful to you for this commitment, this tremendous commitment, thanks to which this third edition of the Franco-German Energy Forum has been able to take place. Constructive exchange on this topic is extremely important, not least under the current difficult conditions. I'd also like to thank the Franco-German Office for the Energy Transition for their excellent work in information and communication, networking. It's um, an unmatchable role that they're playing in bringing together our efforts in our two countries on the energy transition. I'm going to switch back to French. As President Steinmeier reminded us when he was awarding the German Environment Prize on the 25th of October in Hanover, this health crisis must not make us forget the climate crisis. France realized this particularly recently when Storm Alex passed through, leaving major damage in its trail. And of course that is linked to the huge transformations that our planet is undergoing, which we need to find a response to. So the health crisis hasn't put an end to our climate action, quite the reverse. The French stimulus package has earmarked 30 billion euros to speed up the ecological transition. The aim being to make it a primary lever for economic recovery and the transformation of our economy in response to two basic objectives for our public agencies, which is decarbonizing our economy by reducing our carbon emissions by 40% by 2030, that's taking 1990 as a baseline, and supporting our economic sectors of the future by investing money in green technologies, including hydrogen. So the stimulus package is also a response to the expectations that French people expressed in the Citizens' Climate Convention. Our Environment Minister, Barbary Pompili, reminded us that this is a giant step for ecological transition in France and that its ambition, coherence and robustness will tip us into an economy of tomorrow, decarbonized and thrifty in its use of resources. So we're not going to turn backwards after the crisis. We are taking a huge leap forward towards a decarbonized economy. Germany too has undertaken similar efforts because a third of its stimulus package are devoted to the energy and decarbonized mobility sectors. At European level, the recovery instrument Next Generation EU endorses the European Union's ambitions with regard to the climate, both national and European recovery plans are investments in the future of our economies and those of the planet. So the Green Deal that was presented last December by Ms. von der Leyen translates this ambitious objective, wishing to make Europe the first carbon neutral continent in the world by 2050. And I'd like to welcome that partial agreement that was reached a few days ago in the EU Council for European climate legislation. I think that is the outcome of some tremendous work that's been done by the German presidency and I'd like to salute them for that, even though of course there is still work to be done. But of course we are at the shoulder of the German presidency in moving that issue forward. Some mechanisms, including the objective of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by at least 55% by 2030, as opposed to 40% at the moment, will require further discussion. 
But let me reaffirm the full support that France is engaging in that proposal to strengthen the objective for reductions by 2030. And we hope that the European Union will be able to speak with one single voice and coordinate its new contributions in order to respect these national levels and reach the objective set in the Paris Agreement. A few days before we celebrate the fifth birthday of the Paris Agreement, and Niels Annan just reminded us that that will depend very much in future on the results of the US elections, which we may know tomorrow, because we know that Joe Biden's team has a strong team seeking to return to the Paris Agreement, and that would indeed be excellent news. But the world is moving around us, and there have been recent announcements from China about its pledge to achieve carbon neutrality by 2060. That endorses this. That will create a dynamism that will encourage the achieving of these objectives. And we anticipate seeing more at COP26 in Glasgow in November 2021. So in this context, France and Germany have a lot to gain by following up these efforts to coordinate and implement energy transition policies. We've seen this desire enshrined in the Aachen Treaty that's just heard that it was... Uh, we were also reminded by President Emmanuel Macron and Chancellor Angela Merkel in that framework of the Franco-German initiative for European recovery in response to the COVID crisis. And of course, the question of funding and investment in climate policies is key to achieving those objectives. France is about to pass its new financial legislation in order to achieve a greener budget so that we can evaluate the impact of state spending with regard to six environmental objectives, including climate change. That means we'll be addressing our economic practices very closely in this context. Combating climate warming, global warming, is both a political and an economic reality for our two countries. Historically, France and Germany have different energy mixes, but that doesn't mean that we can't work closely together because we share this desire to push the energy transition and the climate transition forward to ensure both our energy economic sovereignty, not only each for ourselves, but also at European level, because it only makes sense in that context. And the Mesebach Climate Working Group, which has been in existence now for a little more than two years, urged us to enshrine these measures within the Green Deal, that is decarbonisation of European industry with a sustainable financing system, intersectoral innovation and a strong circular economy, which would enable us to add fresh impetus to protecting the climate, innovation and employment. We've already succeeded in reaching some specific targets. We've set up the European Alliance for Batteries, for example. We're continuing to work on other initiatives, such as on green hydrogen and setting a carbon price, which is also a key element. Expanding the European Emission Quota Exchange System and also a mechanism for cross-border carbon adjustment should enable us to fight carbon leakage and to protect our companies. Let me welcome the fact that discussions have also been opened towards Poland, a historic partner in our Franco-German tandem as part of the Weimar Triangle in this question of environment and energy. And I'm delighted to see that Mr. Guy Bourget Czetwertinski, the Under Secretary of State at the Polish Climate Ministry, will be taking the floor about his work in the course of the day. 
This is very important so that we can speed up decarbonization. His country is undertaking major efforts in that direction. And in a month, the Genshagen Foundation's Energy Dialogue will also be an opportunity to share our thoughts and our strategies as a triangle. So this Franco-German Forum, Energy Forum, is taking place at a key moment, and I'm sure it can help to contribute to advance our discussions, not only between different states, but also among all the stakeholders, companies, local authorities, civil society, expressing their views here in the spirit of the agenda of solutions that we promoted five years ago with our partners at COP21. That, of course, is very close to the needs of our citizens. It's a very local issue and it will help us to make success of the energy transition. So I hope we have a very successful day. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy the forum. Thank you. France and Germany work closely together and display solidarity. Thank you, Ambassador, for your welcoming words. All good things come in threes. I now hand over to Andreas Feicht, he is State Secretary at the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. Last but not least at all. State Secretary, you have the floor. Thank you. Ambassador Decote. Minister of State Annen, Mr. Rusner, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to express my gratitude too for the invitation to speak here today and for the organization of this forum under these difficult circumstances. It has been mentioned several times, France and Germany are good partners. We closely cooperate when it comes to economic policies, industrial policies, but also when it comes to energy and climate protection policies. And this is of utmost importance during these times. The same applies to Poland. I am very pleased that our colleague participates here today and that the Weimar Triangle will be present at this conference. The energy transition, climate protection policy are European tasks. What we need are drivers at an EU level. So, comprehensive close cooperation is key here. It has become apparent that we are witnessing a historical situation due to the COVID-19 pandemic and its consequences. In Germany, we are experiencing day two of our lockdown with immense economic consequences, of course, and we do a lot in order to mitigate the economic consequences of the pandemic, and I'm sure the same applies to all other European countries. However, we must not forget about other tasks. Colleague Annen has mentioned this. The World Energy Outlook um, was presented in Berlin this week, and one, th um, two things have become apparent here. Firstly, investments have decreased, but less so when it comes to renewables than when it comes to fossil energies, and I'm talking about the global level here. We are seeing an overall trend towards green technologies and sustainability. But when looking at China, we can state that China is the first country worldwide that is seeing recovery after the pandemic and carbon emissions are higher here than before the crisis. And of course, this must not happen here. We have to make use of time. We have to make use of the funds that are provided. We have to use them in a way so that we don't go back to the level of emissions of the times before the crisis. We have to see sustainability after the crisis. That is why the stimulus packages and the economic recovery packages of the national states are key. In Germany, we have provided 140 billion euros in the context of our 
stimulus and crisis management packages. These are historical sums, and we pour them into fighting um, the pandemic. However, 50 billion are provided for future programs, and I'm thinking of digitalization and artificial intelligence, but also about the establishment of um, a hydrogen economy and the support of sustainable and competitive industries. Um, energy efficient refurbishment programs have been ramped up and massively so. People um, are investing um, a lot here and we um, have passed our goals concerning carbon emission reductions. We have expanded funding programs for local public transport. We want to develop um, hydrogen technologies and we will provide 9 billion euros to that end. We will also provide funds or have already done so in order to stabilize the Renewable Energy Sources Act surcharge. We want to gradually decrease it. We have invested in charging infrastructure, e-mobility, and battery cell manufacturing. And we have provided a innovation premium for environmentally friendly passenger cars. All this stands for economic recovery and less emissions at the same time. Europe will do its share. I'm thinking of the recovery instrument Next Generation EU here. What is key here is the recovery and resilience facility too. This facility is particularly important for those regions that are hard hit by the pandemic and by structural change, structural change that is even accelerated by the pandemic. And I'm not only thinking of coal regions, but also of um, the automotive industry. Franco-German cooperation is key in this context. This has already been mentioned. Recently, there um, was an agreement between Federal Chancellor Merkel and the French President Macron and the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. In the context of the creation of a hydro hydrogen economy, we are also thinking of um, important projects of European interest. This is open to all other member states too, and auctions will start soon. But apart from the EU level, there will be Franco-German Beacon projects too, which are currently developed. And to this end, we are conducting talks with French and German companies. We want to shape big projects when it comes to hydrogen. Um, as we already have been successful in this in the context of battery cells. In the context of our EU presidency, we want to create more momentum together with our colleagues with regards to the energy transition. Apart from the creation of a hydrogen economy, the area of wind offshore is key. We want to create enabling frameworks for joint international offshore projects because wind offshore will be key when it comes to providing green power. So there are many things that we want to achieve and that we have to achieve. We have to make use of um, the time. And this is only possible through cooperation at a European level. I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. Thank you for this welcoming address. I now turn to Sven Rösner, director of the Franco-German Office for the Energy Transition. It really is a pity that we cannot meet in person today. However, we can see each other online.
Mr. Rösner, Europa post-COVID and the energy transition. Everybody's talking about the virus these days. Is the energy transition forgotten about a bit? Thank you, Barbara Kostolnik. Of course, I would have preferred to be in Berlin at the Foreign Office today. But we have to adapt to the situation. We learn by the day. Let me welcome our participants. Ambassador um, Dekut, State Minister Annen, State Secretary Feicht, ladies and gentlemen, participants, colleagues. On behalf of the Franco-German Office for the Energy Transition, I would like to say good morning to you. I am delighted to welcome you on the occasion of the third Franco-German Energy Forum. At the outset, I would like to stress that we hope that you, your families and your colleagues are well during these difficult times. The Energy Forum is a key event in our calendars every year and the edition 2020 all the more so because it almost seems as if our work done over the last five years is condensed in the topic of today's conference. Few areas reflect the economic, social and ecological challenges of the present age to the same extent as the topic of energy. That is why it has been at the center of public interest time and again over the last 12 months. I'm, for example, thinking of the German EU presidency with its impetus concerning the energy transition. And I'm, of course, talking about offshore wind and hydrogen here. But I'm also thinking of the aspirations of the European Commission to newly define the future of our national economies through the Green Deal and more ambitious climate protection goals. And of course, a virus has changed a lot within little time, especially when it comes to the European energy industry concerning production and generation, transport, trade and consumption. It has left unmistakable and permanent traces. Uh, but it has also highlighted the challenges of a future climate friendly electricity mix. At the beginning of the year, we last saw each other, Barbara Kostolnik. And I would like to provide you with a quote here. Where da danger is on the increase, rescue is near. I think we have to look into this difficult situation and into the dangers involved, but we also need to think about how we can get out of the situation because we have no other alternative. That is why we are delighted that today's program goes beyond beyond the Franco-German context today. We were provided with contributions from Poland and with the point of view of the European Commission. They are important actors for political and economic strategic decisions concerning energy and climate protection. During these times of change, um, dialogue and innovation are more needed than ever at all levels. The same applies to us. Since March, it has not only been our goal to come or get through this crisis in the best possible way, but to provide food for thought and responses to topical questions. We can't go to the Foreign Office today. However, we are all the more pleased to offer the Franco-German Energy Forum to you in spite of all difficulties via a live stream. Such a project can only be achieved by a team effort. And that is why I would like to thank all participants for your readiness to participate in this dialogue under these difficult conditions. I would also like to thank you for your contributions. We are already looking forward to them. I am sure that they will be helpful when taking stock also at a personal level. I would also like to express my warmest gratitude to the Foreign Office, especially to Division 410. I would like to thank the Federal Ministry for Economic Activities and Energy, and I would like to thank the French 
embassy for the constructive and pleasant cooperation during the preparation of this conference. Let me also thank my colleagues, especially Tim, Julia, Marie, and Celine for their contribution. A big thanks also goes to our interpreters and technicians for their contribution. Without them, such a conference would not be possible. I wish all of us an inspiring day and many interesting insights. And with this, I would like to pass the floor back again to Barbara Kostolnik. Thank you. Thank you, Sven Rösner. And the quote he provided us with was by Hölderlin, where the danger is on the rise, rescue is near. We will now take a short break. Not a coffee break, but of course you can get yourself a coffee or a cup of tea and relax a bit. And then we will continue with our first presentation, um, which will have a political focus. And we will start with Dieter Jürgensen, head of the Director General for Energy at the European Commission. She will join us in a minute, so we will take a short break. Thank you. So, und da ist sie schon wieder vorbei, die kurze Pause. Und wir kommen damit zu unserem ersten Komplex. So, let us turn to our first topic today, the evolution of the EU's energy system until 2050. We will talk about national plans and transnational coordination. And of course, we will also talk about the European Green Deal. And as I've mentioned before the break, Ditte Jul Jorgensen will be the first speaker. She's the head of the Director General for Energy at the European Commission. She has worked there for a long time and she was the head of the cabinet of um, Competition Commissioner Vestega. I will now pass the floor to Ms. Jorgensen. Ah, sie lächelt uns an. Sehr schön. She can hear us. She's smiling at us. Good morning. Good morning. So I would now. Um, pass the floor to you. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope I am, uh, I hope I can be seen and heard. I have slides, which I understand you will be so kind as to help with uh, there. So good morning, everyone. And thank you very much for the invitation to join uh, this, uh, this forum. Uh, you refer to the European uh, Green Deal, and that's where I will uh, pick up uh, um, as well. Uh, because the European Green Deal um, is a priority for the European Commission, for our President Ursula von der Leyen, um, and is built around the objective of achieving climate neutrality in Europe by 2050. Uh, but it, it's also very much um, a growth strategy, a competitiveness strategy, and a resilience uh, strategy for Europe, achieving the climate neutral um, uh, target. 
uh, by uh, in a cost efficient way and in a way that strengthens our competitiveness and, and our resilience. And we carried out an impact assessment uh, this uh, the earlier this year, which came out in mid-September, which looked at can you achieve the higher targets, 50 to 55 percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2030, and can you do it in a way that is also economically sound and viable? And, and the conclusion from the impact assessment was presented in our climate target plan in mid-September uh, and presented by President Ursula von der Leyen in the State of the Union speech. And, and arrived at the conclusion that it is possible. We looked at a number of different options, a number of different uh, scenarios for how to achieve it. And, and what was clear is one, you can achieve 50 or 55% by 2030 as a pathway towards climate neutrality in 2050. Two, you can do it in an economically sound manner. So a way that protects or even strengthens our competitiveness. Um, and three, if you want to do that, you will have to draw on all sectors of the economy. Because energy represents 75% of our greenhouse gas emissions, energy production and energy consumption, it's clear that we will need to act in the energy sector as an absolutely uh, fundamental point, a pillar, the foundation for the overall action towards uh, climate neutrality and towards the, uh, the, the increased target of the 55% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And so what I would like to do today is to address uh, three questions related to the European Green Deal, and that's the next slide. The first question is, how uh, can the changes to our energy system contribute to um, economic recovery because of uh, the COVID crisis and the economic crisis that is following uh, from that? And how do we make sure that our recovery agenda and our green agenda are mutually supportive and fit together? And how can we benefit from uh, the competitiveness advantages uh, that are part of the Green Deal. How do we best do that? Um, and also, how do we ensure just transition? Why is that part of the European uh, Green Deal? Now, the next slide that uh, I will present to you, slide three, um, uh, addresses this, the first question. How, uh, what are the changes that are in our energy system and how can that contribute to the economic uh, recovery? The slide you see here draws on the impact assessment that I just mentioned, the impact assessment for how to achieve uh, the targets, by, the, the increased targets by 2030. Um, and what's interesting here um, is you have the 2030, uh, you have the current scenario, you have 2030, you have 2050. And I think the interesting message here is that in the, the biggest change in the energy system is a significant shift away from fossil fuels, um, uh, both gas and oil and coal, to a much higher share of renewable and green energy or bioenergy. So uh, regardless of what scenario or which option we, we, uh, we use to achieve the target, whether we use a regulatory option, a mix of different uh, options or a cost-based option, uh, well, that is what we see happening. Already in 2030, we would see a significantly increased share of bioenergy, clean energy, green energy in the energy system. Uh, and by 2050, we would be up towards 60% of the bioenergy and, and, and clean energy, uh, maintaining um, a more or less stable level of nuclear in the system, but a significant decrease um, in, in oil and gas. So I wanted to, uh, to lay that out there uh, because I think it is, uh, it is interesting and really confirms that regardless of what instruments we use uh, in order to achieve our targets, we do need to have to see this transition um, in our energy system. Um, and uh, the question here then of the uh, relation to, uh, to recovery uh, and how we best um, achieve that, um, I will go to the next slide because of course this transition, the transition in the energy system towards higher levels of renewable energy and bioenergy, um, of course requires significant investment. And that's what you see here on the right, high, right hand side of the slide gives you an idea of the investments uh, required. Um, in particular, you will see that significant uh, investments, additional investments are needed um, in the transport sector, partly because there's still a lot to do there, uh, but also um, a lot of uh, important investments in the energy sector into grids and into, uh, into power plants, uh, boilers and new fuels uh, a bit less. Um, the residential area is interesting uh, because that is our contribution to energy efficiency. Um, you uh, will probably know that a very large share of our energy consumption goes into buildings, about 40% uh, and about 36% of our greenhouse gas emissions. And so in order to achieve our objectives, we need to become more energy efficient and we need in particular to improve our building mass um, uh, in that context. 
And that's why we launched the renovation wave uh, just a few weeks ago, which sets out a strategy for how to increase, how to double the rate of renovation so that we can become more energy efficient um, in our building. And in order to achieve our targets for 2030, um, we have a very strong basis in the national energy and climate plans that member states uh, adopted earlier this year and, and which we have just uh, been assessing. And the key message I would like to pass on the energy and climate plans is that they provide a very useful uh, and strong basis, not just for achieving the current 2030 targets, um, but also for uh, a stepped up efforts towards the increased targets because they lay out the national plans of the of the energy uh, transition towards uh, greener energy and cleaner energy. Uh, but they also provide a very strong basis for the recovery plans, for the national recovery and resilience plans that are due under the next uh, generation and under the common recovery package um, to uh, help bring investments to the areas that are required as part of the Green Deal, but also the areas and that are best at bringing uh, growth and jobs to, to Europe uh, as part of the uh, as part of the recovery. So the national plans um, are a very very good framework and should help member states draw up the uh, recovery and resilience plans as well. Now, when it comes to investments into the energy sector and into the transport sector that are mentioned here, I think it's important to note that 37% of the recovery and resilience facility will be spent on uh, climate related investments. So that is up to around 249 billion euro that should be available for climate related investments. Most of the energy investments that are envisaged in our climate target plan, most of the investments that are needed to get to the 2030 and 2050 targets, well, those investments would account for climate investments. Um, and so there is uh, there is both room for and need for investments into those sectors, um, as, I, as I mentioned um, earlier. And there it's clear that the recovery and resilience facility is the single most important instrument um, for, for member states to start uh, with, those, uh, with those investments. What we have done from the Commission uh, in that context is to identify specific flagship areas that both meet the interest of the green transition, so to make the recovery green, but that also um, meet the interest of job and growth uh, creation. What we see overall is that the energy sector is particularly well placed to both create jobs and to help uh, support or, or bring about the green transition. Um, and for that reason, we have two uh, specific um, energy related flagship uh, projects. One is the one called Power Up, which would um, support significant increase, 40%, uh, of renewable power generation um, and also electrolyzer capacity for green hydrogen which is another flagship and another priority uh, to help uh, produce uh, renewable hydrogen, hopefully already by 2025, in line with the hydrogen strategy we adopted earlier this year. So one important flagship project is, uh, is Power Up, related to, um, to, as I said, renewable uh, electricity generation to grids, but also very much to electrolyzers for the production of green hydrogen. The second flagship under the uh, under Next Generation EU that I wanted to mention uh, in the energy sector is that uh, one is, is, is the Renovate uh, flagship, which of course relates to the building renovation and the renovation wave that I mentioned earlier, uh, which could help double renovation waves already by 2025 and foster much deeper renovation, thereby significantly increasing the energy efficiency in buildings and lowering the energy use um, and the greenhouse gas emissions that come from the, come from our buildings. So these two flagships in the energy sector really are um, significant contributions both to uh, both to the green transition, but also very much to the economic recovery and jobs and growth in the next area, in the in the next years. And what I would mention also in relation to renovation is that that is the that is the sector that by far gives the highest number of jobs per million invested. Uh, the, in, the International Energy Agency, and I know Mechthild is also here and will speak later, the International Energy Agency and Fatih Birol earlier this year, at the beginning of the crisis, uh, carried out an analysis um, of green recovery um, and that identified renovation and energy efficiency in buildings as a key sector in, in, the, in job and growth creation, in addition to uh, helping green the, green the recovery. And one of the interesting things about the sector is, of course, that a lot of the jobs created are local jobs, so um, even more important in, in the transition and in the recovery context. Moving to the next slide and the next question around uh, the impact on competitiveness, how do 
the impact on competitive and competitiveness, sorry, how do we make sure that we stay competitive um, at this time? And so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Green Deal is also a strategy for jobs and growth. Um, we have, uh, we need uh, we need to make sure that the green transition and, the, and our growth and competitiveness is uh, that there are synergies uh, there. And, and one of the most important contributions in that context are the clean um, energy technolo technologies, where we already are highly competitive in the European Union and France and Germany, uh, very much so, very um, key players in this sector as well. And, and what we see in, the, in our strategy on energy system integration, our strategy on hydrogen, uh, but also some of the strategies that we have planned uh, for later this year, is that uh, we will have the ability or should have the ability to develop new markets based on the new energy system, the integrated energy system of the future. And, and we see that the European Union is well positioned for global leadership uh, in that, simply due to the current position we have and to the to the the first mover advantage and, and to the existing um, industrial structures uh, in Europe. Some of the sectors where we are particularly competitive and really can build a, um, a strong presence also in global markets would be district heating, smart grids and appliances, uh, digital tools to support the integration of electric vehicles um, or, or other facilities. Uh, I mentioned earlier hydrogen and electrolyzers, so green hydrogen production and supply. Uh, but also demand side equipment um, are, are important uh, aspects of that. Um, so um, there are many technologies uh, where France and Germany um, are leaders. Um, uh, um, so uh, really among the industrial powerhouses also in this, uh, also in this sector. Um, as part of the State of the Energy Union, the report on the State of the Energy Union that we published just a a few weeks ago as well, we also published a report on uh, uh, competitiveness and on uh, research and innovation and technology. And, and what we saw there, what we uh, concluded there, is that the clean energy technology sector largely outperforms the conventional energy sector and creates more value added in addition to more jobs. So what we need to see at a European level is further cooperation in terms of research and investment. Um, and we need uh, also to look at industrial scale applications. We need alliances and cross-border projects and um, projects of common European interests. Um, uh, and we need uh, um, investment, as I said, into the energy sector. I would like to make two examples of investments that are needed and that are ongoing, including in, as part of recovery. The first one is offshore wind industry, um, which has a really significant capacity to innovate. We have seen very significant cost uh, decreases over the last years, and we have seen a very um, impressive uh, improvement in performance. We are currently the European Union collectively. We are currently global leaders. 93% of the offshore capacity that was installed in Europe in uh, last year was produced locally by Siemens, Gamesa, uh, Vestas, uh, just to mention some of them. We can also see that in offshore renewable emerging technologies, such as uh, floating offshore wind, we are also spearheading and have a number of projects planned um, and uh, and will be installing um, quite significant amounts of megawatt uh, in Europe by 2024. We also have an interesting supply chain and innovation system, both in those established technologies that I mentioned, but also in newer technologies um, and should build um, a competitive uh, position uh, there. What we do need to do, how, however, is to significantly scale up the investment into this uh, and scale up the generation facilities. And we will be presenting an offshore strategy, an offshore renewable strategy in the coming weeks, um, exactly with that purpose, helping to create um, the appropriate um, European framework, both from a regulatory perspective, but also from an infrastructure and financing perspective to help develop uh, further the uh, offshore renewable energy sector in Europe. Um, the second example I wanted to point to is hydrogen. I've mentioned it already, uh, the renewable hydrogen, where we have uh, in Europe significant manufacturing capacity for electrolyzer technology. I know that you in France and Germany are hosting some of the most successful companies uh, for hydrogen technologies, such as uh, electrolysis, uh, fuel cells, uh, refueling infrastructure. And, and I know that you have a strong potential for production of uh, renewable and low-carbon hydrogen also going ahead with interesting projects planned uh, and with the potential for important projects of common European interest and um, also related to the Hydrogen uh, Alliance. 
But also here, we will need to significantly scale up our efforts and scale up our manufacturing capacity for electrolyzers so that we can achieve the 40 gigawatt um, target of electrolyzers by 2030, um, including through the European Clean Hydrogen uh, Alliance that has, been, that has been launched. The next slide and the next point I wanted to, to, to make is that of just transition, um, because that is an important part um, of the European Green Deal to help make sure that all parts of Europe, all regions of Europe, all countries in Europe benefit from the growth potential and uh, and make the most out of the green uh, transition also from a recovery and growth uh, perspective. And um, it's important to make sure that also low income households uh, will uh, will benefit and will not uh, suffer as a result um, of the green transition. What we see in general across Europe and also at a global level is that low income households spend higher shares of their income for energy services than wealthier ones. And, and we also see that some regions in Europe will be affected more by the transition because they currently rely on carbon intensive um, uh, energy uh, processes, fossil fuels, or um, because they, they are carbon intensive uh, in their industrial um, setup. So we need to make sure at a European level that we address the socioeconomic consequences. And that's why we have placed just transition at the heart of the European Green Deal. Um, an important aspect of that is, of course, the phase out of coal, of lignite, of peat, or of oil shale. Um, and for example, in Germany and Poland, um, you have uh, uh, ambitious in Germany ambitious plans to achieve that, um, and that will have to be uh, followed by a question of fairness and how to ensure that that transition takes place uh, in the best possible way. There is some very positive experience uh, in that context, um, including in France and Germany. Um, there has been the phase out of hard coal in the Hauts de France and Grand Est regions in France, and in the Ruhr and Saar regions uh, of Germany, um, which I think has given us some experience and some lessons learned that can hopefully benefit um, at a European level to help facilitate the phase out um, of coal. Um, and then we have good experience in building bridges among coal regions, encouraging coal regions to cooperate, for example, between German, Polish, and Czech coal regions. There are good experience. Um, we will be supporting the coal regions and the phase out by the Just Transition Fund, uh, really dedicated to support those regions and people who are most affected by the transition. Um, it is, as you can see on the map, uh, it is relevant for all of Europe or for some regions across Europe. Um, in, in Germany, we're focusing on lignite areas, so it's our suggestion to focus on lignite areas. In France, we're suggesting to focus on regions that have a strong industrial legacy, um, as you can see uh, on the map. An important point linked to the just transition and to the impact of the transition on European citizens and on, on energy consumers, um, a, a key point of that is energy poverty. We still have about 34 million Europeans that are unable to afford keeping their homes warm. Um, and this is uh, one aspect of energy poverty that we must uh, address. This is, of course, closely linked to the renovation wave. If we have more energy efficient home, higher quality homes, um, through renovation, then that limits energy poverty. And what we have also done from the European Commission is to present a recommendation on, efforts on energy poverty, so to give member states guidance for how to, how to address it and how to develop the, the best uh, financial solutions for lower income households. So that brings it to the end of my slides. Um, we, uh, in conclusion, I would simply uh, note that uh, we have a challenging um, economic context uh, uh, and challenging uh, by the day with the continued persistence or with the continued presence of the virus in European societies and the, uh, and the necessary measures that have been taken by all member states in that context. Um, so all the more important to get the green transition right and to make sure that the green transition also becomes a recovery and growth uh, strategy that strengthens our competitiveness, that brings growth to Europe, that brings jobs to Europe, um, that addresses the economic and social uh, challenges um, through investments into, among other things, clean energy projects, uh, into clean energy generation, um, uh, and into renovation for energy um, efficiencies. So this was an attempt, and I hope for, uh, it's been clear that these are the areas where we see, uh, uh, where we welcome the strong cooperation between France uh, and Germany, and where we think there is scope to build on the competitive uh, assets that we already have. And hopefully to share experience from the Franco-German cooperation 
so that that also can help drive uh, change um, and and positive uh, benefit to uh, the rest of Europe, for example, in the Weimar Triangle or in broader regional cooperation across Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Jorgensen. That was really quite a, a splendid presentation of the European Green Deal. I do have a question. If the EU objectives are to be raised, how will that affect the whole issue of renewable energies? Can you give us a brief answer to that? Uh, it's quite a broad area, but perhaps you have a short answer. Yes. In the impact assessment we have, uh, we have carried out, um, it is clear that uh, in order to achieve the increased 2030 targets, the 55% greenhouse gas uh, reductions by 2030, we need to significantly scale up the share of renewable energy in our, in our energy mix. And in the national energy and climate plans, we already see uh, quite impressive plans. We see that member states collectively meet the current targets and actually are slightly above the current targets. We would need to do more there, but we would need a higher level of uh, renewable energy in our energy mix, uh, but we are on the, on the right path to that. But we, we have tried to do with the strategy on energy system integration of the offshore uh, energy strategy, but also with our proposal for a new, uh, for revised regulation of trans-European network, is to make sure we have the best regulatory framework, it's part of the energy union, the internal electricity market, uh, but also that we give support to the infrastructure investments that are needed to achieve those targets. So a significant increase in renewable energy, uh, and in particular, a, a higher level of electrification of the European energy system. Thank you very much, Ms. Jorgensen, and uh, thank you to you. We're going to stay with climate change, and we're going to come on to our next speaker, who is Mechthild Vosdorfer, who is Director for Sustainability, Technology and Outlooks at the International Energy Agency. She's had a number of managerial positions at the Commission and also worked on the Energy and Climate Policy Framework up to 2030 and the Energy Roadmap for 2050. I hope you can hear me, Ms. Wellsdorfer. If you can hear me, then we're going to hear you in a moment. You're going to be talking about industry, climate change, mitigation. You're going to be talking about reducing emissions, but also staying competitive. That's quite a lot. You have the floor, ma'am. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction as well. It's a pretty exciting topic. I've been listening along this morning. At the IEA, we have the World Energy Outlook. That's my topic. That's our flagship at the IEA, at the International Energy Agency. We published this three weeks ago, our outlook, and we had an opportunity yesterday in Berlin to do a virtual presentation with Dr. Feist and others. So part of what I am saying today will depend on that World Energy Outlook. This relates to technology studies and innovation studies for industry that we are also engaged in. I'll be coming on to those in a moment. Let's start with the first slide, please. First of all, just briefly by way of an introduction, what is the situation COVID in the energy sector. All over Europe, here in Paris, in Germany, everywhere, we're going into a second lockdown, and we've analyzed how that is going to affect energy demand. You can see here, in historical terms, it's basically the biggest shock in the last 70 years, since the end of the Second World War. Global energy demand is probably going to fall 6% in 2020. Of course, if you compare that, it is a tremendous shock for the energy sector. Next slide, please. If you look at the global decline, basically oil, gas, coal are affected. But of course, that affects CO2 emissions as well. The transportation sector has been more or less stagnating. If you look at oil prices, they're very volatile this year. They've just fallen again. So this 
has an impact on carbon emissions. And we think that by the end of this year, globally, we expect to see a decline of about 7%. That's 2.4 gigatons for 2020. Of course, all of that's temporary. We saw after the financial crisis in 2008-2009, where carbon emissions also slightly declined, that in 2010 there was a rebound effect and emissions actually quadrupled. We need to avoid that, and that is the objective of my presentation, and it's something that previous speakers have already mentioned. We are now entering a phase of recovery and growth stimulus programs that Germany, France, the EU, and other countries are setting up. And there's an opportunity there that green technologies, energy investments, can be focused, strengthened, in order to avoid that rebound effect. Next slide. We've already heard that investment is important. For 2020, we expect that overall, you can see the figures here, we'll see an increase. Basically, we're looking at oil, energy, oil, gas and coal. We're seeing an improvement for the cleaner energies in their share. So if we're talking about energy renewables and efficiency, they are declining, going to decline less than the traditional sectors. Nevertheless, if we want to achieve net zero by 2050 and the Paris Agreement targets, we have to invest a great deal more in clean energies. And that's why this small decline in 2019 is, a, is bad news if we don't immediately make up for it in our recovery plans. Sorry, says the speaker. Next slide, bitte. Next slide please. We've examined these recovery plans and the question we asked ourselves is how can we achieve a situation whereby these targets we set ourselves with the Green Deal, Chinese announcements, South Korea's plans last week as well, once net zero in 2050. We're working together with a lot of different governments, but in the present crisis, the idea, of course, is to set energy and climate targets, but also to maintain employment and competitiveness. Every government is fighting the virus and the economic situation that's been triggered by that. So jobs are, of course, top of the agenda. We have calculated that about 40 million people work in the immediate energy sector, and we look to see how could we agree that those jobs can be preserved or new jobs created in the energy economy while we rekindle that energy economy in our recovery plan. So that we can issue recommendations to governments for achieving these targets. The most important thing is to act now in the next three years and, as I just said, make sure that these investments feed into clean energies. Next slide. If we look to see how the 40 million people who work immediately in the energy sector in 2019, or did in 2019, including coal, gas, oil, but also in renewables and clean energy. How can we preserve those jobs? We looked first at 2020. You can see the red bar. We analyzed that about 3 million of those 40 million jobs will be lost because of the impact of the COVID crisis and that probably another 3 million jobs in associated areas such as automotive, building renewal, 
and other industries will be affected. So the sustainable recovery plans that the EU, Germany, France and other countries are adopting need to reinforce existing projects to preserve jobs and support new projects with very short start-up periods. And we think that in the next three years, with another an additional 3 million jobs, that is altogether 9 million jobs, can be preserved and created. And where in the energy sector would that be? We can see most of the opportunities lie in improving energy efficiency. Of course, that affects building modernization, insulation and other measures of that kind. That's very job intensive. That's why we think that 35% of the jobs that could be created would lie in improving building efficiency, another 25% in electricity, electric vehicles, that includes networks, and others spread across those other sectors. So we've looked very closely to see where jobs can be created so that we can issue recommendations to our members, members of the International Energy Agency. We've had direct contacts with Germany and France, and of course, looking at the EU's Next Generation Programme, which aims to create jobs in clean energy, we've been supporting that work too. I'm going to come back to carbon emissions. I said that in 2020 they are falling. In the previous year, 2019, across the world, we actually saw an increase in carbon emissions. And let me just show how the EU, not just with the European Green Deal, has been defining new ambitions for the future, but the EU, including Germany, France and other EU member states, have already achieved quite a lot in the past. The EU is globally a, the leader when it comes to reducing energy emissions. And we can see that here. These are figures for 2019, so pre-COVID. If you look at the emissions in the European Union, they declined by about 5%. Germany 8%, France a little less. And the driver here was, of course, the power sector. The decline came mostly from electricity, renewables, energy efficiency, nuclear, and coal to, power, coal to gas switch. That's where we saw the most reduction. In 2020, as I said, we expect to see a temporary decline. The aim now is in the future if we look at 2019 as the beginning of the decline so that we can achieve the Paris objectives with net zero. And of course, there are a lot of challenges there. Next slide. If we want to achieve our climate targets, at the International Energy Agency, in our World Energy Outlook, we have one scenario which is compatible with the Paris Sabor Agreement, which would achieve net zero by 2070. And this year, for the first time in the World Energy Outlook, we worked on a scenario to achieve net zero by 2050. That would be a global scenario for net zero emissions. And we showed what fields of the energy sector can contribute to this. I think everybody knows, and the focus is often on the power sector. That's the starting point. And already this contributes 40% of the energy-related carbon emissions worldwide. We know that, of course, in the EU, a great deal has been done in member states such as Germany and others to reduce coal or phase out coal. But worldwide, the most recent coal-fired power stations in Asia are only about 12 years old. So we have to do more in that sector. And we can see that electric vehicles have been a success story. The electrification of our cars will contribute to 
and mitigating emissions, but that is not enough to achieve net zero. Let's look at the next slide. And now I'm going to look at the significance of transportation and especially planes, ships, trucks, not just e-cars, but more long-haul travel. A lot of emissions come, of course, from long-haul travel and heavy industry in general. And here, 55% now come from industry, transportation and buildings. So they are at the center of our efforts. Moving on to industry, heavy industry here, 70% of direct carbon emissions from industry come from three sectors, chemicals, steel and cement. Heavy industry has to meet particular requirements, of course, and they still have a huge input of fossil fuels. That relates to temperature processes, thermal processes in chemicals, steel and cement. This is the basic input for producing plastics and many other products and it is used for chemical reduction. So chemical steel and cement account for 70% of the direct carbon emissions here. So we need to come up with ways of reducing their emissions. Next slide. If we assume that we need to come up with strategies, we can see the challenges. Steel is traded globally, so here we need to look out for competitiveness because this is a globally traded product. Cement tends to be produced more locally, although we are seeing a growth in that sector too. Of course, a lot is used in the construction sector and chemicals. What options do we have to reduce these hard-to-abate emissions. I'm going to talk about two or three aspects of that. To reduce industrial emissions, of course, energy efficiency and material efficiency are key. And industry has done quite a lot towards this already in past years. Here you can see a comparison for Europe. This is the industrial sector energy efficiency measures since 2000. What would the picture be without those measures and what has been achieved? If you look at the efficiency directive, performance of buildings directive, product directive, design and other measures taking place in the industrial sector, we can see that across the EU industry has Im implemented quite a deal. Without that energy efficiency effort, our carbon emissions here would probably be about 255 megatons higher. So that is, has been a success and we have to carry on along that route. If we look at the next slide, it shows how much France and Germany that you can sue here have achieved by implementing these mandatory energy efficiency policies agreed with the EU, obviously in agreement with the member states. For example, in industrial motors, in products, in labels. All of this has led to a tremendous success so that the share of final energy consumption, if we look at, compare 2010 and 2018, has improved by more than 10% as a result of those mandatory efficiency policies. So that is a success story in order to mitigate emissions. Next slide. Apart from energy efficiency and material efficiency, there is, of course, another focus on technologies and innovation. 
And here we carried out a deep dive study and looked very carefully at which technologies of 400 different options contribute most to decarbonization in industry. We did this for transport as well, but here I'm talking about industry. These are technologies that have already been mentioned. Hydrogen plays a big role here. CCS, uh, carbon capture and storage, sustainable battery technologies. They are all at different stages of the process, of course, and we know to achieve net zero emissions, a lot of those technologies that are not yet ready for market need to be refined. And that includes hydrogen for steel, carbon capture and storage, and other measures, technologies that we will need in order to achieve this carbon emissions. About half of these, if we look at the next slide, about half of these technologies are currently not yet market mature if we want to achieve net zero emissions for 2050. So we have to create a market, and that is our objective for the hydrogen strategies that have been adopted by Germany, France, and the EU. I have to say in my team, in writing their hydrogen report, I think they've pointed out that this is the technology which has the best cover in Europe, but also in Canada, Australia, hydrogen strategies are being developed. So we have a best platform practice here, a best practice platform, ways of improving these technologies, especially green hydrogen technologies. Let's move on. Again, to come back to industry, we think there's an opportunity here now in the growth and recovery programs to incorporate heavy industry, to drive innovation forward there so that in these industries where there is both an infrastructure rather like in the energy sector where the plants have a lifetime of 30, 40, 50 years. And there we have to make realize that every 25 years this innovation or investment cycle is repeated. The next investment cycle will be an opportunity to introduce these new technologies such as hydrogen and carbon capture and storage large scale across the sector and that could lead to a reduction of the carbon emissions that we need for net zero in 2070 or 2050 possibly if we look at this slide if we speed this all up if we can accelerate all these measures then we could see that in the next round of investments these technologies can be incorporated and enough investment is made so that from 2030 onwards we start to see this big fall and uh, then of course the prices could also fall. If we look at the other sectors, transport, buildings and so forth, heavy industry is a really important sector for decarbonisation but every effort will count towards net zero 2050. I'm coming to my conclusion, my last slide now. I just want to sum up by saying that we've seen that this year, 2020, COVID-19 has had an impact, a dramatic impact on the energy sector. And that won't just be this year. It will continue to be felt for some years, certainly in the energy sector. In the World Energy Outlook this year, we developed a delayed recovery scenario, which I think at the beginning of the year we discussed, along with the net zero 2050 scenario. And then in April, May, June, we drew this up as a possible scenario. But now with the second lockdown, it's even more likely that we're going to see a delayed recovery. If you look at the World Recovery Outlook, you'll see that until 
energy demand achieves last year's levels, it could take a few years if COVID continues. But there is some good news here. If we look at the energy sector, renewables, energy efficiency, and decarbonization of industry and buildings, if we take all those as important components of our growth and recovery programs, just as Germany, France, and the EU have been doing, and if appropriate budgets are committed to that so that we have a framework, those investments can be activated in such a way that we achieve our targets. Germany and France are globally leaders in clean energy, hydrogen, energy efficiency, along with other countries too. And we at the International Energy Agency will continue to analyze what is happening and to draw up our policy recommendations for governments. And we will help to enhance the dialogue. Thank you very much. Yeah, wir danken Ihnen, Frau Börsdorfer. Thank you, Ms. Verstorfer, for your presentation. I have one more question to you concerning the new EU goals concerning carbon emission reductions. They are very ambitious, we know, but we are also talking about new industries here. How can this be reconciled, and do you not expect a carbon leakage, especially when it comes to um, chemicals and industry? Of course, this risk exists. As I've said, the steel sector is international, and it has to be the goal of the EU, together with other countries, of course, and I'm thinking of China and the US, to engage in a dialogue. Um, the goal is a level playing field here. The EU has created a successful emission trading scheme. We know that China wants to establish a similar scheme. So if there is a level playing field, um, measures will be effective at an international level. However, we are thinking about um, carbon border adjustment at an EU level. This is, of course, a complex topic, but if used in a targeted way, for example, in the steel or cement sector, this might contribute to competitiveness. But um, there are still debates ongoing concerning this. And of course, it has to be our goal to maintain competitiveness um, of those industries that are strong in Europe. Thank you very much, Ms. Wurstdorfer. Thank you for your presentation, too. Um, I would like to mention once more that, of course, all presentations will be sent to the participants. So um, you will be able to take a close look at all slides that you are seeing here today. Let me now turn to a key element of the energy transition in Europe, grids. I would like to welcome Vera Brenzel. She is the Director of um, Public Relations at Tenete. She used to work for E.ON. Ms. Um, Brenzel, I hope you can hear me. So let me pass the floor to you, Ms. Brenzel. We can't hear you. Could you switch on your mic? Ms. Brenzel, we can't um, hear her. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Great. Ms. Brenzel, I will pass the floor to you now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning to all of you. It is regrettable that we can't be in Berlin today. However, the sun is shining in Brussels today. I am delighted to talk about the topic of grids today. However, I would also like uh, to talk about evolution, the evolution of the EU energy system, because this is part of the title too, isn't it? The Green Deal debate should also lead to us questioning why we need this. The word deal makes me think of Eleanor Roosevelt's 
Welt um, program to fight the Great Depression. I think that we are seeing a similar situation today. I think we're talking or trying to achieve a Man to the Moon project. It really is the biggest political program in Europe, at least in terms of growth, decarbonization, investment integration and redistribution. I think with the Green Energy Package, we have already had um, very positive conditions. Um, with positive effects on many areas. But in this case, we will see great legal changes too. So I think this is unprecedented at a European level. I think that it's also very important to understand that the economy needs to work for people and not only the other way around. I think that this is also important philosophically speaking. Now we ask ourselves, how can we implement this? And that is why it is important that um, we look at this in the context of COVID-19 too. And that is why I am very pleased that this is also at the heart and center of today's conference, because the comprehensive transition concerning industry, transport, energy is a huge investment program too. And the COVID crisis, of course, also hampers this. How we, can we um, translate this into opportunities? Mechtel has already mentioned this. How can we secure existing jobs through this, but also create new ones? Um, I thought that the number of 40 million was interesting. I think we have to go beyond what we have seen here so far. Looking to the US, I would like to say that the left wing of the Democrats also engages in this topic. They want to completely change their economy within the time frame of 10 years. They are also talking about grids and infrastructure, high-speed trains, digital networks, um, further training programs. So we're not exclusively talking about made in Europe here. There are other people engaging in this too. I would now like to turn to the next slide, please. Thank you. And please let's move one slide forward. Thank you. So what are the long-term policy goals and market design? Fundamentally speaking, we are talking about accompanying the economy in this process of transformation. We need to implement the stimulus programs in a targeted way so that concrete measures can be seen soon. I think concerning a cost-benefit analysis, um, this is still ongoing. So there's still a lot of work cut out for us. But we must not lose time here. There's too much uncertainty in terms of markets too. Of course, we also have to maintain competitivity. We need to prevent carbon leakage. Can carbon leakage be prevented by way of a carbon border tax? That is the question. It is an interesting um, concept, but we need to engage this in a nuanced and proactive way because there are also disadvantages involved in this, of course. The Green Deal is more than an ecological deal, of course. We are also talking about um, social acceptance here. Environmental management is also key, also in my work. So we have to convince people each day anew that we need ugly um, networks and grids. So this also involves the task to reconcile individual and overall interests. What does this mean for transmission systems? The all ex electricity society is not the future, but we could talk about a more electricity society. This means that we have to further enhance electricity grids. Renewable generation um, is key. And we're talking about massive investments here too. 
That is why one thing is key. At a European level, we need to see the closest possible coordination. And I'm talking about the energy internal market here. We need to keep working on this. At the same time, emission trading schemes, not only when it comes to electricity, but also when it comes to other industry industries, um, has to be advanced. Plannings, approvals, standardization of technology and um, common regulations are key because, again, we are talking about massive investments. Um, we need to coordinate here. Sector coupling has not been mentioned much lately. People like to talk about hydrogen now, but still um, the interconnection of different sectors is of utmost importance. This is a coordination task which seems very difficult to solve. What is the leading infrastructure? Um, in this discussion, are we talking about the electricity systems or are we talking about industrial centers who will take um, key decisions here? Everybody has to sit down at the same table here so that we can find the most efficient solution. I'm not only talking about electricity grids here, I'm also talking about existing gas networks. But I'm also thinking about hydrogen networks, digital networks, transport networks, heat networks. They all have to be integrated in a better way because what we plan today will mean that we will need more flexibility in the future. And this cannot only be achieved by way of electricity grids. That is why an integrated planning is necessary. Industry can't do this alone, and governments can't either. So um, what is involved in this? Grid expansion, offshore. We're talking about a hub-and-spoke concept here. We are trying to identify this. So we are in the middle of the planning process here. Hybrid interconnectors? but also hybrid wind farms. And all this requires regulations that go beyond guarantees of origin, of course, um, concerning renewables regulations. We need to see changes too. Um, I would also like to talk about uh, renewables in general because we need to see more acceptance still. Concerning grid expansion, we lag behind, for example, in the Netherlands, but also in Germany. And here I'm uh, talking about the reconciliation of digitalization and renewables. Next slide, please. What about Tenet. This is day two for me at Tenet, so I don't know all about this company. But however, it is the biggest cross-border transmission system operator. And this is quite interesting, isn't it? Because on the one hand, the North Sea is a very special economic area indeed very inspiring when it comes to development. Both the Netherlands and Germany have many electricity neighbors, so to say. So again, we need to see more coordination here. Under State Secretary Barker, we engaged in um, more vibrant debates here, but now we have to see more grid expansion. And I'm not only talking about electricity grid expansion, but also about the expansion of other grids. Tenete invests four to five billion euros per year, um, and we're talking about a lot of money here. And there are tough challenges involved for a company like this. We are talking about employment, recruitment. We are talking about a culture of performance that we need to identify. How can this be done? How can we look at current operations and reconcile this with this large-scale expansion 
and guarantee security of supply. These are tough challenges, and there are not many role models. Even in the energy area, there is probably not an investor that is bigger than Tenet. Uh, Tenet had 15 interconnectors in neighboring countries, among them Norway, Great Britain, Denmark. Um, I'm also thinking of Belgium and Germany and the Netherlands. The question is, how can we um, better interconnect our systems in the future? Next slide, please. Um, I think in this context, the following is important, and I would like to provide you with an example here. In order to develop 100 gigawatts offshore in the North Sea, and we are talking about the supply of 150 million customers by 2050 here, we need an interconnected approach, interconnected planning. I'm not only talking about sector integration here. No, I'm talking about um, fundamental system development. What do we expand first? A hydrogen pipeline, for example? Or do we try to solve this by way of the electricity grid? Buzzword redispatch grid. The costs involved are very high, so we have to think about our priorities. So we need to see a well-organized start concerning hydrogen industry. We very much welcome that the German EU presidency at the beginning of October um, launched a debate on this topic, commissioning the European Commission to engage in this. We're not only talking about the North Sea here, there's also the Mediterranean and there are also other industrial centers who need to see more integration, um, intergovernmental and intersectorial integration. Concerning the entire energy and electricity system, it will be key how we can generate green hydrogen from renewable electricities. Looking at renewable potential today, um, this is a key. We need all of this for green power now. If we want to produce green hydrogen too, we will need more. This becomes from the capacity of electrolyzers in the Netherlands and in Germany. So we have to think about this. Who is supposed to receive this green power? And we can't answer this question right now. In closing, I would like to say, without a strong, innovative European economy, we will not reach our climate goals. Production, jobs, investments, expertise, all this has to be maintained and further developed in Europe. We must not see carbon leakage. And this calls for a, let me say, iterative process in order to achieve this great Man to the Moon project. Thank you for your attention. I would like to pass the floor back to the host. Thank you very much, Ms. Brenzel. I think for the second day at work, that is already quite uh, feet. But um, how does Corona, how does COVID-19 impact on the finance, on the financing of the grids? And um, if you actually want to make a future prediction, how long will this be felt by us? Well, I think what, what you can say is that particularly the electricity industry, uh, uh, comparatively speaking, um, at least if I compare to other sectors of industry, um, has been arguably been affected least by this uh, crisis because people switch on their uh, light, they um, still cook, they uh, still use their washing machine, so they use electricity to a fairly large extent. So I think 
um, you can't really talk about a significant drop in consumption. And then um, grids are defined in such a way that um, over a longer period of time, you do allow for a refinancing of um, the grids. And that's 40 years, so that, um, let's say, um, tariffs of about half a year um, uh, of disruption or of economic shock, uh, well, are not particularly impacted. So that's probably not the right yardstick. Um, what is a, a right yardstick is employment, uh, investment, future of this particular branch of industry. And I think the structural changes have become even more visible uh, through um, the crisis and, and probably have become more acute. So there's a n there are a number of branches of industry that are um, undergoing a profound um, structural change. And uh, for example, transport, um, the automotive industry. And there we do see um, new uh, needs, uh, but we also see, obviously, um, a growth in talent um, and talent that we recruit. There's competition um, for the best talents, for the best minds, and the market is right now. Um, in a way, a buyer's market, if you like. So um, there are a lot of very good uh, young people um, that um, are on the labor market that are out, out of work right now, which is dramatic. But, uh, well, we hope that we can employ them in the electricity industry. Thank you very much, Ms. Wenzel. And uh, our best regards to Brussels, uh, because you know, obviously you have to benefit from it when the sun shines in Brussels. I don't know whether you seen this, but um, all of these three speakers have been women. So there's a 100 percent uh, women uh, quota that we've achieved even before the coffee break, which is quite breathtaking. And before some of the men are sort of alarmed about that, obviously after the coffee break, um, that picture will be recalibrated. So don't be afraid. And now we'll have a coffee break. So if you can, please. Uh, 11.45 sharp, join us again. The best thing is probably when you s remain online and then we have our first panel that we launch on energy policy in the Weimar Triangle. We have a number of um, uh, colleagues there um, and experts uh, from in the field and also obviously um, my colleague, my very dear uh, colleague um, who is going to moderate this. Thank you. See you later.